Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. And I promise to tell you some things tonight, and I'm going to tell you some things tonight, okay? We're talking about the judgment of God. Chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. Because what may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. There's a lot in that statement. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us, and we thank you for the blessings of life that you show us. And Lord, tonight as we break open your word, just open our eyes and ears to see the truth, to hear the truth, and Lord, then to take the truth and apply it to our lives. Lord, we need to understand this passage of Scripture. Because this passage of Scripture is what will move us, Father. So put a burden on our hearts. Let us dig deep into the Scripture. Let our minds be open to understand. And then, Lord, as we understand and apply it, let it move us. Let it move us throughout our community, throughout our county, throughout our state, and to the other most parts of the world. Lord God, we love you. We pray these things in your Son's name. Amen. Man faces wrath. It is something that we're all going to experience. We're going to experience it through Christ if you're a Christian. I want you to hear that. There was a point in time when Christ came. He went to the cross and He suffered for the sins of the world. And he has decided, and God in all his wisdom has decided that somebody's going to pay for sin. Either you will pay for your sins or you will allow Christ to pay for your sins. And it's left up to us as to which happens. God has given us the ability to make a choice and to choose. There was a speaker of one of the more liberal denominations about 10 years ago at their conference. And he stood up and he said, we don't have to evangelize anymore. Through the study of the Scriptures, we have realized that God is a gracious God and a good God. And if He's gracious and good, He would never send anyone to hell. So we don't have to worry about people anymore. They're all going to heaven. That's universalism. I went to a conference last year at New Orleans Theological Seminary and the professor stood up and he made this statement that there are certain denominations in this land that we live in that think if you go to church, if you worship God in some shape, form, or fashion, that God will honor that, and that you will get to go to heaven, and that's inclusivism. Well, I'm going to tell you what that really is, lies. It's lies. Because God, according to His Word, it's impossible for God to lie, and as you read the Scriptures, you find out there is a heaven, and there is a hell, and the greatest... Understanding that comes from the story of the rich man and Lazarus, and they both died. One went to hell, and one went to be with Father Abraham. So God teaches that through the Scriptures, that there is a heaven and there is a hell. There are two resurrections Jesus taught us. There's a resurrection of the living to heaven, and the resurrection of the dead to hell. So throughout the Scriptures, we find that heaven and hell are real places and people go there based upon the choice that we are allowed to make. Why? Why do people have to go to hell? 
That's what we want to look at first. So we're going to look at this, and there are several reasons. And tonight, if you look at verse 19, to break it down very simply, this is what it says. Because what we know about God is put in us. It's manifested in them. You see it? For God has shown it to them. In other words, God has revealed Himself to man. And it's been put in man a a nature from God that we are to worship God. Because of our fallen nature, we have decided that we will worship something. It just may not be the true and the living God. So you go all over the world and you find places where people are worshiping and they're worshiping different things. You go over to India and they worship everything from rats to cows to heavenly gods, as they call them. In in the years of Christ, the Romans worshipped many different gods. The Greeks worshipped many different gods. You go into the Middle East and you find the group that worships what is called uh, Mohammed or Islam, as they worship God in in their own way. You go over to the middle, over to the Asian part of the, the world, and you'll find Buddha there. You have the Hindus. You find so many different types of religion. And we wonder why that happens. And the reason it happens is because God has put in us the understanding that we are to worship God. Now, why don't everyone worship God? The true and the living God. That becomes the question. God is revealing Himself. And here's something I want you to understand. There are two ways that God reveals Himself. There is what we call special revelation, where God reveals Himself in a special way to an individual. Kind of like Paul walking down the road to Damascus. God intervened and gave him special revelation. Kind of like Moses at the burning bush, where God showed Himself and proved Himself. And throughout the Scriptures, you find instances of special revelation to people. Most of the time, it's when God has something special for them to do. There's also some that go back to Africa. You remember the Ethiopian eunuch? As Philip was moved by the Holy Spirit, here came the chariot by. He was reading out of the book of Isaiah. Philip runs along, stops the chariot, he gets up in the chariot, and God uses Philip to give them special revelation. But then there's a second one called general revelation. And general revelation is what every single person born on the face of this earth is allowed to see God in. And that that general revelation is found in, in creation. As you look at the trees, you realize somebody created that. As you look at the the animals that walk across the face of the earth, you realize that something put them there and that something is God. You look at a child when that child is born and you understand that it is the miracle of life and through that miracle of life you understand that God is. You can go across this great land and look at the modern, the the beautiful wonders that God has put, the Rocky Mountains, the Grand Canyon, the Niagara Falls, and you look at these things and it brings you an understanding that God created this world. If you want more proof than that, all you have to do is look at certain things like the sun. The sun. The sun produces so much horsepower... In just a minute, it is enough horsepower to one to run one billion three hundred one tree and three hundred billion Corvettes wide open all day long. Now that's a lot of power, a lot of horsepower. You think about the rain that falls and how this rain, if if an inch of rain falls, there are forty six thousand gallons of water per acre. What happens to that water? Well, it runs right on off because God has created hydraulics, physics, and gravity. 
It's all by the power of God and the hand of God. And so as we see these things, we are held accountable because we have a general revelation that God is. The question is, why do we worship something else? If we understand that God is, and God has put something in us that causes us to worship, we look at this creation, we should worship God. But you go around the world, and you see places like the Amazon jungle, or these islands in the South Pacific, and there are people gathered there, and you... And they were found, and when they found them, they were worshiping totem poles. Why? How can God not... They know, they know to worship, but they've never heard about Christ, so how can God hold those people accountable, becomes the question. Well, let's begin to look around. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3. Paul writes and he says, Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Well, there it is. We're all condemned to death. We were all just like that, fulfilling our own desires and our own lusts, going through life, not worrying about God. We see everything just like everybody else, and so we just go through life. We were just like those people. Now you have to understand what Paul is saying. We today were just like the people in the Amazon jungle and just like the people on the South Pacific Islands that had not heard the gospel. We were just like them. Now hold on to that thought. Along comes Revelation. Acts 14. And verse 16. Acts chapter 14 and verse 16. This is what it says. Who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. There was a time when God just let everybody walk just like they wanted to walk. You can go back to the days of Noah and God before Noah... And the flood, God had allowed people to do what they wanted to, to walk like they wanted to, and they chose to do what was wrong, and we will choose to do what is wrong each and every time without Christ. So there it is. Now, stay with me and go to chapter 17 of Acts and verse 23. This is what people begin to do. It says, For... Paul is is speaking, and he's up on Mars Hill, if you will. And he says, For I was passing through, and I considered the objects of your working. I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. What, What we're saying here, what Paul is saying, you're worshiping everything, and you don't want to miss anything. You don't want to miss the real God, so I'm going to tell you who the real God is. But when you begin to break it down and look at the psychological element of man and how we want to worship something, these people knew that they were to worship something. And so they began to create many different types of God because they wanted to appease the God and they didn't want to miss Him. They wanted to appease the God of the universe. And so they made a bunch of gods. Just like the people in the Amazon jungle and just like the people in the South Pacific Islands who had never heard of Jesus. They never heard. Paul's there telling them for the first time. Okay? Well, look at John chapter 1 and verse 9. I want you to follow this train of thought. We know that we are to worship, and so we worship something... And we create gods to worship. 
And then he, who does this? Who, who knows about God becomes the question. So in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 9, that was the true light, that's Jesus, which gives light to some men who came into the world. That's not what it says, is it? Gave the light to who? Do y'all believe? Do y'all believe that? So, if you believe that, if you believe that statement, God gave light of who He is to every single person on the face of the earth. That would include the people in the Amazon jungle and those in the South Pacific and those up around the North Pole, wherever they were. Somehow, God revealed to them that there was a true and living God and they needed to worship Him. So man is without excuse. Every single person on the face of this earth is without excuse. There's no reason for people not to worship the true and the living God, Jehovah, His Son Jesus the Christ, who is our Messiah. Now you've got to hold on to that thought because that's what it is. Revelation is ours. Notice Psalms. Go with me to Psalms now. In Psalms 94, and beginning with verse 9, well, we start with verse 8. Psalms 94 and verse 8. It says, Understand you senseless among the people. You need to understand. And you fools, when will you be wise? And then the psalmist begins to talk to people. He who planted the ear, shall he not hear? He who formed the eye, shall he not see? He who instructs the nations, shall he not correct? And so here is God, and God formed the ear. We need to hear, but God hears what goes on. God formed the eye, and you need to know that God sees what goes on, and God instructs the nations. He teaches man knowledge. And you need to understand in the Hebrew, that is all men knowledge. All men have a knowledge of who God really is. Okay, I got this story, or this reminded me. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 4. Out of a commentary, I was reading, trying to pick up on some stuff. But go to 1 Samuel chapter 4. In 1 Samuel chapter 4, there's the Israelites and here's the Philistines. And the Philistines are going to go to war with the Israelites and, it, and Samuel is not in charge yet. He's not the prophet of the age. There's Eli and his sons. So you look at chapter 4 verse 1, and the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines and he kept beside Ebenezer and the Philistines encamped in Ahek. Look down at verse 3. And when the people had come into the camp, the elders said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us. And so they say, let's go out and let's get the ark. And the ark represented God to the children of Israel. And so they're saying, let's go get God and bring God into our camp. Verse 5. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted so loudly that the earth shook and when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, what does the sound of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? Then they understood that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp, so the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, woe to us, for such a thing has never happened before. Woe to us, who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods. These are the gods that struck the Egyptians with all the plagues of the wilderness, be strong and conduct yourselves like men, you Philistines, that you may not be become servants, that you may not become servants of the Hebrews as they have been to you. Conduct yourselves like men and fight. So the Philistines fought and Israel was de defeated and every man fled to his tent. There was a very great slaughter and there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. Now, 
Here are the Philistines, and here's Israel. And we understand the story. But the, the nation of Israel had began to put their faith and trust in a gold-plated box which had angels and a seat on top of it that they carried. They had come to the point where they forgot that this was something to remind them of what God did in their lives. And so they quit worshiping the true and the living God and they worshiped this thing and that's not the only time it happened. Because in the wilderness, they began to be bitten by snakes and God said, put up, Moses, put up a brass serpent and whoever gets bit by the snake, if they'll look at that in faith, they will be healed. And when you get to the day of Jesus, Jesus said they began to worship that bronze serpent. They begin to forget about God, but they know they're supposed to worship. And even God's people begin to worship stuff and things and not God. You go on into the story and the Philistines get the ark and they realize that it's something special. God had given it to the Israelites and He wanted to stay with the Israelites. So He sent plagues to them and they punished the Israelites through these plagues to the point they wanted to give it back. Okay, The key here is why do people worship the things that they worship? Why do we worship the things that we worship outside of God? Because it is just what? Stuff. It's stuff. Now, I want you to see something else. Out in the South Pacific, there was an island that during World War II, these natives on that island had never seen a white person. Well, guess what happened in World War II? We were trying to defeat the, uh, the Japanese in the Pacific. And so all these troops showed up one day at this island. They took over the island. They built an air base, put a little naval station there, had ships coming in, built refueling tankers. And the Navy and the Marines and the Army took care of these natives. And the planes would come in and they would get food and stuff and material possessions off to give to these natives so that they were basically renting the island from these natives. And that was a good thing. Of course, the United States won the war. And one thing we realized, we didn't need those naval bases anymore. So all of a sudden, they picked up everything and they left. And left the natives there. They were not evangelized. And so people go back in the 1960s and they get to this island and there are this, these natives still there. And they have taken an old wrecked airplane and made a shrine out of it and were worshiping that airplane. And when they talked to them about it, they said the airplane brought in everything we needed. It is like a god to us. And so they were worshiping the airplane. Matter of fact, they built a, a worship center in the control tower of the old airfield that the Marines used, and they worshiped that air tower because they had been told the people in the tower talked to the airplanes, which brought the stuff that they got. They wanted a God to give them something. But they began to worship stuff. Stuff. I started this by last week telling you about why the people in the South Pacific will be judged. They've not heard of God. They've not had an evangelist to come see them. They don't have the Scriptures. So how can God punish them? In 19... 47, there was a Norwegian historian and he decided that he would build a raft and he would float that raft with a sail on it from Peru over to these islands because he believed that that's how they got there. It's called Kontiki. And it's, they've had a special on History Channel because they tried to do it again. Well, in 1947 or 48, whenever he made the trip, he traveled 4,500 miles on a raft, him and five other guys. They made it all the way to an island, and, and that proved how those people got there. 
So what's the point to that? Here these people are as they begin to grow from generation to generation. And now here they know that there is a God out there because God has put it in their heart and life to worship something. And so now the question is, what are they going to worship? And those people begin to worship stuff. And they would cut down trees and make totem poles. And they would worship these totem poles. So are they responsible? And the answer is yes. You want to know why? They built a raft and they floated it 4,500 miles to get to a place where they wanted to live. And if they really wanted to find God, they should have built another raft and got on that raft and sailed back the 4,500 miles and tried to find God. They are without excuse. But guess what? We are. Those people... In the South Pacific, even though they're not able to travel or don't want to travel to find God, God has told us to do what? Go. Go. Just as if, just as they are responsible for not seeking out God, we are responsible for not going to them with God. We have to share the gospel. But if we don't make it, they are responsible to find the God that God has put inside of them that desire to worship something. They need to be finding out what they're supposed to worship. Therefore, everybody is without excuse. There is not one soul on the face of the earth that does not receive Christ through faith that will not go to hell. Every one of them. If they don't receive Christ by faith, then they are going to hell whether they're in the Amazon or whether they're on the South Pacific Island or whether they're at the North Pole or the South Pole. Wherever they are without Christ, they are going to hell. They need to find God and we need to take God to them. That's how it works. How responsible are we becomes the question. I was sitting in class year and a half ago, it was a systematic theology class. And the professor looked at me and he said, what does it take to get the gospel to the darkest parts of the world? There was a guy named Luther Rice. You may have heard about the school, Luther Rice. In 1847... He and another guy got on a sail ship and sailed over to India. While he was there, he met William Carey. Y'all have heard the name William Carey, right? Down at Hasburg. Who was a missionary to India. A Baptist missionary to India. Luther Rice began to talk to William Carey and this other guy. And so Luther Rice decided after staying there for five years to come back to the United States. And he came back to the United States with a purpose. His purpose was to raise money to finance the missions that were going on in India. He was married. He spent his whole life. He, had, he was a man of wealth when he started. He spent his whole life trying to raise money for missions over in India. Every penny he raised, he sent off. He was a rich man when he started. He died in poverty. He died in South Carolina. But let me tell you, they reached a lot of people for the Lord. So he asked me, what does it take? Do you know there's 15 million Southern Baptists? 15 million of us. That's a lot of us, isn't it? You know, if we all got on an airplane and we went to the deepest, darkest parts of the world, 15 million of us, we could win some people for the Lord. Well, preacher, we can't all go. I can't go because I don't fly, right? But what can we do? We can give. We can pray. We can support. Because I want you to know that 12-year-old boy that looks like a 
Hawaiian down in some South Pacific island, if he catches pneumonia and dies without Christ, guess what? There's no excuse. The mother of two down in the Amazon, if, her, if she dies, leaves those children, and she dies without Christ, there's no excuse. God says, you worship me. But He also said, go. Go. Matthew acts throughout the Scripture. We need to be about reaching people for the Lord. With that said, let me tell you this. The people in this community that die without Christ, they're just like the people down in South America and in the South Pacific. They go to hell if they don't have Christ. Think about that. Stop right there. Prayer list.